Good morning and welcome to worship here at Braddock Street Church, where we strive to be followers of Jesus, loving God in worship, loving others in small groups, and serving the world in mission. My name is Annalise. I'm one of the pastors here at Braddock Street. I'm so glad that you all are joining us today. We hope you'll take a moment to look up at our screens here, and they'll let you know how you can send us in some prayer requests if you have them. And also, uh, they will let you know that if you are a new person, we really hope that you will take a moment to come and get to know us out there in the gathering space um, after worship today. I um, also want to remind you all that while we sing, we are still wearing masks, and that is to protect those who have not been vaccinated yet in our congregation. So um, we do ask that at least during that time, you keep a mask on while we sing. Um, and otherwise, if you're fully vaccinated, you can do whatever makes you feel most comfortable. With all of that said, I ask that you would stand as you are able and join with me in our call to worship. The slave said to the master, Sir, the invitations have been delivered and there is still room. Then the master said to the slave, Go out into the roads and lanes and compel people to come in so that my house may be filled. Let us pray. Holy, holy, holy God, fill us with strength and courage, with discernment and compassion, that we may be your instruments of justice and love in this world, that it may be on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. And now we will sing our opening hymn, Holy, 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 the first and last stanzas. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Barb Patton, and I will be reading today from Colossians 4, 10 through 17. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoners, greets you as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, greets you. These are the only ones of the circumcision among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you. 
He is always wrestling in his prayers on your behalf, so you, you may just stand mature and fully assured in everything that God wills. For I testify for him that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters in Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it read also in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you read also the letter from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, see that you complete the task that you have received in the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Barbara, for uh, dealing with all those names. Good morning, everybody. My name is Kirk Nave. I'm one of the pastors here at Braddock Street Church. Today we conclude our series called Building Bridges. We have been looking at a number of things. The first week we looked at the reason we exist as a church, and that is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. The next week we talked about, well, how do we get started in that process? Last week we talked about using our own existing social circles, and today we're going to build on that with a concept called fresh expressions. Let's pray together. Holy God, this world needs your love. Thank you for doing your part, sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to give his life that the world may know that you love us all. Now, Lord, help us to do our part to share that love with our neighbor in word and in deed and in any way we possibly can so that everyone might know the amazing love that you have to share with all of your children. In Jesus Christ's holy name, amen. Today, without really any introduction, I want to start with a simple video illustration. Fairly simple. Many of us have been playing with magnets since we were kids. The illustration is quite simple. First, there's two things to notice. First, the way the two magnets are ori oriented determine the kind of reaction the magnet gives, right? The poles are the same, they're opposite, and they are repelled. The poles are opposite, and they are tracked, and they come together. Think about that in the way that the gospel of Jesus Christ is shared between two people. If it's oriented one way, say you approach someone wanting to share your faith with a complete, total stranger, you want to have that deep level conversation about what you believe, is there a God, what is that God like, people are going to be repelled. Or if you start with a phrase like, if you die tonight, are you going to go to heaven or hell? Ooh, people are going to be repelled. You get the idea. Of course, if you change that and you start with genuine loving concern from, for somebody you know, there's a good chance if you have something to say that is authentic, they'll be attracted. If you begin with a position of absolute unconditional love, right, they'll be attracted. If you start with, I accept you as you are, they'll be attracted. Now, in reality, that's another sermon for another day, but you get that idea. I'd like to deal today with something even simpler. How close are the magnets? Did you notice the invisible hand that comes in from the side that moves one magnet closer to the other? At some point, the magnets are so far apart that they absolutely have no impact on one another and might as well be in two different universes. Think about that in terms of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we are far apart in outlook, but even something as simple as geography, there's no impact at all. And for many people in our society, church, the gospel of Jesus Christ 
is just absolutely irrelevant. Might as well be in two different universes because we're not taking the gospel close enough to the people. Think about that. We can be irrelevant. One of our church members shared with me an article, I think it was out of the Washington Post years ago, about medieval cathedrals in Europe and how beautiful they are and yet the fact that there's no one in them on any given Sunday. And so those cathedrals being built as they were in typically medieval times by a king or queen, you know, built by the government, they're still owned by the government. And so they're being used now as things like shopping malls, skateboard parks, and so forth. Western Europe is a bit ahead of us in that decline of the impact of the gospel on our society. But I will always remember a friend of mine, he's an attorney, he's from Perth, Scotland, he kind of, his faith kind of came to life while I was his pastor, and he went to, to work in London for a couple of years, and he came back. He said, our, our family's really having trouble finding a good church home. Actually, he said, Kirk, you've got to go to England and become a pastor. I said, why, Bob? He said, well, first of all, they pay them very well, and secondly, their services are so boring. That was his impression. You understand? It, it was like an effort an effort to practice the simple spiritual discipline of worshiping. If the church has become irrelevant, what do we have to do? Like two magnets. What do we need to do with the magnets? Bring them closer together. In other words, take the church to the community. We can have a beautiful sanctuary. We do. Beautiful steeple in the community. But if if going to church never crosses your mind, it's just another building in the community, right? You walk down the Loudoun Street Mall, you walk by this store, this store, First Presbyterian. You, know, you walk up Wolf Street, but walk by Braddock Street. It's just, it's just another building. It's not relevant. It has no impact on the person's life. Maybe you're there geographically, but in terms of the, the circles in which you move, it's just, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. So let's turn to Paul this morning as he writes to the church at Colossae. I've got a little map here just so you get the idea because you see Book of Colossians. We forget this is a place. Colossae is there along with Laodicea in Herapolis. You heard Barbara read that. They're just three little cities close to one another in the middle of what they called at the time Asia Minor. This is today a part of Turkey. I always just like to give it some context. Paul's probably writing about the year 60, 61. He may be in prison in Rome, and he's writing a letter to the Colossians, the church at Colossae, real people. And the reason I asked Barbara to struggle through all those names is notice the intimacy right? Name after name. It reminds me when certain relatives tell stories, well, you know, you know so-and-so. I'm sorry, I don't. Who is this person? Oh, it's my cousin on my third side lives, you know. Paul is writing in a sense like that, but he's assuming that people in the church in Colossae know the people he's talking about. This person greets you. This person greets you. And finally, he says this in chapter 4, verse 15. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters of Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. We think, well, that's unique, a church in a house. And we forget that for the first three centuries of Christianity's existence, they were not allowed to build churches. Most churches were in homes. Here's a picture of one in, uh, it's called Dura Europus. It's in Syria probably around the early third century. And the people who did this, the archaeologists say, whatever evidence they found, the, the little part, a compartment to the right is probably a chapel. That when this person built their house, they made room for their community of faith to gather on a weekly basis. I want you to understand the intimacy. And the fact that little church, small church, is not only legitimate, it's how the church was when it started for the first 300 years. Now, some of us clergy are guilty of saying, well, this is what we need to go back to. Not necessarily, no. First of all, notice the theology was all over the place from different house church to different house church. This letter written to the church at Colossae is dealing with what we theologians call the Gnostic heresy. I won't go into the details of that, but some people believe that all you had to know was the little secrets and achieve enlightenment and connect with God. Just free yourself from this material world because what really matters is the spiritual world. And Paul is like, no, how you love your neighbor makes all the difference. He's writing to correct their theology. 
And he's writing also that the whole church will hear this letter. We forget that when we're reading Paul. We think of letters written from one person to another. But these letters were to be read to the whole church. And notice he said, oh, also share this letter with the church in Laodicea in case there's any trouble over there. Right? But church was intimate. Church was small. Let us remember as Methodists that when John Wesley founded this movement, which was originally a movement in the Church of England, it was the small groups that mattered, the societies, the classes, the bands. Here in the colonies and then the early United States, the preachers would move from place, preaching place to preaching place. The people would still meet every week and have church. The preacher may come by once every three or four months. This is how we started. And still today, in certain places in the world, like China and Iran, people are still worshiping in churches. I got a picture here of a, of a house church in China. Obviously, they can't build a church facility. I'm not even sure if the gathering is legal in China. You can also notice they have the same technological problems we do. They have their projectors down on the table, and you look up at the ceiling, the projector mount is up there. They had to make a change. We all have the same problems. The point of all this is simply you and I can worship God anywhere, anytime, any place. You don't have to have a pastor with you. You don't have to have an organ or a praise band with you. We can worship God and form communities of worship anywhere. Like the magnets. Take the gospel of Jesus Christ to where people are. Because, let's be honest, a lot of people aren't here on a Sunday morning or even online with us on a Sunday morning. One pastor whose works I've read, whose workshops I've attended, he's now a retired United Methodist pastor, a guy by the name of Mike Slaughter. I was in one of his workshops, and he said, I, okay, I confess, I was on vacation, it was Sunday morning, and I didn't go to church that day. But you, I went to the gym instead, because I do that every single day. You know what I found out? People aren't in church, they're in the gym on Sunday morning. And he said his brain began to wander. How can people be this committed, you know, they're doing two miles on a treadmill, and they can't be <laughs> ask, expected to come to a worship service on Sunday morning. He began to compare the commitments, but think about it in these terms. If this is where the people are on Sunday morning, why not take the gospel there? That's a radical idea for a lot of us, particularly people like me, born and raised in a church. 11 o'clock was the time, you know, the designated time to worship and so forth. And it doesn't have to be Sunday morning in which you do these kinds of things. I'm calling, called this sermon Fresh Expressions because it was the Church of England, of all people, that discovered this idea, and it's actually working there. And I thought, Western Europe, the United Kingdom, my friend who always said the Church of England services were so boring, if it's working there, I need to look at it. And the principle's really simple. Whatever groups you're already a part of, build those relationships, and then begin holy conversations. They will happen naturally. You know, you're with somebody for a long time, you get to know them, maybe you're doing two miles on a treadmill together, you have conversations. Every now and then it turns to something like, oh, my spouse and I are having troubles, or I just lost my job, or my parent, one of my parents is really ill, or something's going on, and they will ask, how do you deal with this? And I've said it before, I'll say it again, please don't quote them scripture. Start with, Something like, well, I don't have all the answers. But I know that when I went through a tough time, this is how God helped me. And that's your story. It's unique to you. And that's what people want to hear. Is God real? Is there a God? Does God exist? Does God make an impact? Does God make a difference in anybody's life? If they know, you care about them. As another human being, you accept them as they are. You love them as they are. Unconditional love. They're going to listen to what you have to say on difficult questions. They really are. It's fertile ground. What if you had a group of people together that would look at these things? Each one of those can become what the Church of England is calling a fresh expression. One church in which it was applied here in the United States is Wildwood United Methodist Church in Lochlusa, Florida. The pastor is Mike Beck, and after they started... His wife was also licensed to be a pastor, and so they co-pastor, Michael and Jill Beck. Mike Beck was one of these people who was raised in the church by his grandparents only, became a young adult, and as he said, went far from God, wrestled with addictions and so forth. And he said, for that reason, I just have a passion for other people who don't know Jesus Christ. 
And he was appointed to this church that had 12 people in it. 12. That's all they had. The first thing he did was take the door off the pastor's office. He said, the door's off because you can look in there and you're not going to find me. Now, you know, some existing church members want to know where their pastor is, say, on Monday morning at 10 o'clock. He's like, I'm not going to be there. I'm going to be in the community. One of the groups he started initially was called uh, Skate, Pray, Repeat. He was an inline skater. And he would do that for exercise on a regular basis. And there were people he got to know. And they began having conversations. Next thing you know, he was offering to pray with them from time to time. And they appreciated it. And then they developed this thing called Skate, Pray, Repeat. Skate a while. Talk about God, maybe study the Bible, pray together, and then they'll go back to getting their exercise in, spiritual and physical exercise. Not too long, of course, in about a year, the church had over 100 people in it, and the people in the congregation took the same idea to the places where they were working and living and associating with other people. One one group was yoga therapy. Here's a picture of one that was started at Moe's Southwest Grill. They call it Burritos and Bibles. Meet on a weekly basis and study the Bible. You know what happens when customers see that, right? What's going on over there? Curiosity begins. Another group is called Church 3.1 Exercise Group. Here's a picture of another one. It's called Pause of Praise in the dog park. You know, walk the dog every single day. Meet all these people, start conversations. Why not say, you know, what's going on? How are you doing? The early Methodist said, how is it with your soul? We've got different translations, right? How are you? And eventually, can I pray for you? That sounds tough. Another person started Sheer Love, S-H-E-A-R. She's a hairdresser. She cuts hair all week long, and then there's a designated time for anybody that wants to come to talk about God and study the Bible. Another one started in a tattoo parlor. That looks a little different from Braddock Street, doesn't it? Faithfully fit. Short devotion and group walk. And then one that I would probably relate to more, Taste of Grace. Just a communi- weekly community meal, and they gather for prayer and a meal. You get the idea. Move the magnet. Take the relationships that maybe we're already having, those relationships we might have in, in the organizations we're a part of. I had a high school group in a church one time said, can you come do Bible study on Wednesday mornings? Yes, in the public school. I I get tired of people saying you can't do that in a public school. Yes, you can do it in a public school. You get a teacher sponsor. You go, you know, before school starts. Yeah, you can do it. It's not a problem. We had Bible study on Wednesday morning before school. You can do anything. I've heard of kayak church and all these different kinds of things. And of course, here at Pratt Street, I know we've got at least one. We've got the Lake Frederick group. Somebody moved into the community, started coming to Braddock Street, Took it upon themselves. These are my favorite things. I had nothing to do with this. Took it upon themselves to just start a Bible study in their own neighborhood, and it's going strong. Not everybody in the Bible study goes to Braddock Street. That doesn't matter. But it's taking the gospel to where people are. Sometimes it's as simple as moving the magnet. Things that are right in front of us that don't seem like ordinary church, so we don't think that's legitimate. The early church did it in a house. The Methodists did it in homes. We can do it wherever people are. So let's take the gospel in a new day with new opportunities right in front of us. Let's take the gospel to where God's children are. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I'm going to turn to Annalise now. She's going to give me the prayer request that you have sent in through the week and this morning. And I invite you now to enter into a time of silent prayer. Thank you again, God, for sending us your amazing love in Jesus Christ. We confess that we need your help in knowing how to share the gospel, this this same love with our neighbors in ways that they can receive it. And as we pray for ourselves and 
ourselves as a church family. We also pray for individuals in our community and beyond. We pray for Ed Orndorf, Harold Ogg, Jim Athern, Steve Lobel, Mary Lou Sprint, the family of Rosalie Lewis, Ann O'Donnell, the family of Jerry Bayless, Walter Barr, George Semple's family, Ann Stein, Whitey Meadows, David Kerr's family, Adrian O'Connor, Clint Nichols' family, John Allen, Jeff Stefanowitz, Robbie Robinson, Bill Vanskoy, Phil Newcomb, John Goodlow, Mike Ricketts, George Morris, Denny Bromley, the family of Ruby Cook, for Benjamin Fromm, for Cheryl Humphreys, for Riley Ames' brother, and for others whom we name now in our hearts. And God, we also pray for all of your children beyond our community. We pray for all victims of COVID-19, and we pray for their families. We pray for strength and endurance for all of our health care workers and our essential service employees, for all those who are, are forcefully exposed to this pandemic. And God, we humbly ask in Jesus' name to rid us of this scourge not only in our own community, but across the globe. We pray for healing. All these prayers we ask in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This time we're going to show our love for God by offering our gifts, and we always like to let you know the many ways that uh, your giving makes a difference. This is our missionary, sponsored by our United Methodist Women, as well as your own giving. This is Elizabeth Nichols. She is a missionary in Sneedville, Tennessee, where she provi- helps to provide and coordinate fresh water, food, decent housing, as well as spiritual development for people in that community. It's called the Jubilee Project. It's just one of the many ways that you share the love of Jesus Christ in this world. And so now, let us show our love for God as we offer our gifts.
Welcome to God's table. This is a table of love and grace, and it is a table that is open to everyone. It doesn't belong to us, it doesn't belong to Braddock Street, it doesn't belong to the United Methodist Church. This table belongs to God, and therefore, all are welcome. Christ, our Lord, invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's take a moment of silent prayer and confession. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the the name name of Jesus Christ, Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind to set free those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. And by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to us, your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. And on the night in which he gave his life for us, our Lord took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup And when he had given thanks to you, he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here in this room and upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by His blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again and we feast in final victory at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, 
All honor and glory are yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now let us pray in the words our Lord Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As Annalise said, if you're new here, you don't have to be a member of our congregation to receive the body and blood of Christ. For Christ is the host of this meal. Anyone who wants a new life in Christ is always welcome to this table. Secondly, communion in a pandemic is awkward. There's just no way getting around it. So we have prepared for you, um, we didn't prepare them, prepackaged communion elements this morning that are on a table in front of each section of the room. This section to the left, if you'll come down the aisle in the middle and return by the organ side, the people in the main section here in the middle, if you'll come down this aisle to my right, your left, pick up the elements and return to the other aisle. And for you folks, if you'll come by the outside first and then return by the inner aisle, that'll help us from bumping into one another. I'm going to ask you in a moment to come up and take one, try not to touch anybody else's, right? And then take it back to your seat and open it. I warn you, it's a challenge. Those of us who've done this before, it's a challenge. So we're going to, take, we're going to be patient because it's going to be a while before everybody's ready. So open it up and then just wait and then we'll all receive communion at the same time. Will you please come to receive the body and blood of our Lord Christ? So once you've had a chance to finish the wrestling match, you can just look up and let me know that you're ready. And now, the body of Christ, broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Preserve your soul and body unto everlasting life and feed on him in your heart by faith and be thankful.
Holy God, again you have fed our very souls with the spirit and love of our Lord Jesus Christ. How can we say thank you enough? But now, Lord, we ask that you help us to rise from this table, empowered by Christ, to share this love with the world around us, that the world might be changed, transformed by your divine love. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us stand and sing our final hymn together. As we go, a couple of things that we want you to be aware of. First of all, our church council, our governing body, is going to be having a day retreat in late August. And in preparation for that, we want to know what the congregation is thinking. We're coming out of a, well, coming out of a pandemic. Um, and we're listening for God's call to lead us into the next year. And so we will be sending a survey by email. If you don't do email, there's some written forms on the table in the gathering space. You can pick one up. Uh, but we want to know what you think. Where is God calling us as a congregation to be in ministry next year? And secondly, of course, with uh, the pandemic taking a different turn in recent days, for those of you who are on the Healthy Church team, you don't know it yet, but we're going to meet this week um, and reevaluate where we are and how we gather together as a congregation. It's the world we live in. And no matter what the world we live in, God's love triumphs. So go now to share the love of Jesus Christ in the world and with every person you meet. Go with the love of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.